The oldest and strongest human emotion is fear. And the oldest and strongest type of fear is trepidation of the unknown. When we were children, our parents told us that monsters didn't exist. But we were sure that something was lurking under the bed or in the closet. Fear sees even if our eyes are closed. Welcome to the realm of the arcane. My name is Lon Strickler. Join me as I examine unexplained creatures, strange manifestations, and remarkable realities. Imagine this next hour as a voyage of discovery to strange lands, seeking not for new territory, but for new knowledge of the supernatural. Come on board as we begin this adventure together. Hey folks, good evening and welcome to another episode of Arcane Radio where we explore the unexplained live on Beyond Explanation. I'm your host, Lon Strickler, coming to you within a cannon shot of historic Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Now, once again, Arcane Radio and Beyond Explanation channel is made possible by you liking, subscribing, and sharing our programming. Super chat donations are essential for us to continue offering you our unique content. Your consideration is very much appreciated. Now, tonight, I welcome our friend and colleague, Ken Gerhardt, to Arcane Radio. Now, Ken is widely recognized, a widely recognized cryptozoologist, author, and TV personality. He has traveled the world searching for evidence of mysterious animals, including Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, the Chupacabra, Mothman, and the Beast, the Javudan. Now, Ken has written six books on the subject of unknown creatures, and his research has been featured on numerous TV shows, including Missing in Alaska, Monster Quest, Ancient Aliens, America, Unearthed, Unexplained, and Legend Hunters. Ken's website can be found at KenGerhart.com. So, Ken, thanks for joining me this evening. Good evening, Lon. It's always good to see you, my friend. Thanks <laughs> yeah. for having me on. It's, I don't uh, know if we've been together since uh, the COVID thing started or not. Maybe maybe we haven't. No, I think it's been at least a year and a half, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, after the last book, perhaps. But yeah, it's been a while. How, how have you been doing? You hanging in there? Oh, barely hanging in there. <laughs> well, that's everyone. But, yeah, uh, I tell you. Yeah. So... Um, <laughs> Your 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 recent book is uh, is a central guide to Loch Ness monster and aquatic cryptids. Mm -hmm. um, I've been going through it this week, and before we start just dissecting Nessie, <laughs> let's first go into the recorded history of phenomena and how the lore of this cryptid began. Yeah, well, um, like many cryptids, uh, you often find folkloric, uh, anecdotal folkloric tales and legends. Uh, you know, and this is true, of course, for Bigfoot and the Yeti and the Almas and other man beasts and, um, you know, Thunderbirds and, and lake monsters. And, you know, in terms of Nessie, um, of course, we're talking about the highlands of Scotland and uh, there are enduring legends of things called water kelpies uh, in, in the Gaelic folklore. And uh, water kelpies were said to be kind of shape-shifting water beasts, uh, sp spirits sometimes, but uh, that would lure uh, unsuspecting people into the water and, and drown them and drag them down to their watery graves. And um, the descriptions uh, or the depictions of water kelpies and Gaelic legends uh, were kind of like a uh, the head of a horse and a horse-like upper half, and then kind of the bottom half, more like fish-like or you know aquatic with a long tail and stuff. So um, similar to other around the world, you have like in Greek mythology the hippocampus and and creatures like that. So that's kind of like at least in terms of Loch Ness. Now you know we can talk about lake monsters around the world, of course, and you know and uh, lake. Lake Champlain there in upstate New York and Vermont. You had the, the Abenaki and uh, the Mohawks and others had, had legends of horned serpents. Uh, 
Ogopogo and Lake Okanagan, Canada. Of course, you had the Nahatik, was the local water creature. And so you find this around the world as you look at a lot of these uh, modern sightings of lake monsters, and then you have that folkloric aspect or, or background. So, um, you know, folklore, of course, is a major component of cryptozoology. And um, this is mainly because um, several remarkable animal discoveries of the past century or so were kind of uh, came from that realm, like the Komodo dragon, the giant squid, the okapi, the mountain gorilla. And so you, you can find examples of these, you know, the, the, the native, the, the indigenous people will, of course, they always know about the animals that they've encountered. And uh, so I guess in that respect, they're not really unknowns, <laughs> but, but to uh, traditional quote unquote, Western scientists, these are, you know, if they're not in a book somewhere documented and described. So anyways, so yeah, so we have the, uh, in Scotland, we have the water Kelpies and nearby in Ireland, where there are also a lot of lake monster traditions, you also have things called uh, pasties uh, mm -hmm. or uh, horse eels, uh, as they're often called. So again, a, a reference to a horse and, a, and you know, I'm not for, for a moment suggesting that we're talking about aquatic horses here or equines, but, uh, I, you know, I think there are some physical things that, that can be talked about and we can get into that as well. So Sure. Yeah, I, I'm interested in, in your research. I know you um, you came up with a theory that kind of made the rounds in the crypto world as far as what you believe that uh, Nessie actually is. Why don't you talk about that a bit? Yeah, well, it's it's not necessarily my theory it's a theory that i kind of revisited and um you know i, I know a, a huge proponent of, uh, was uh, of the theory was um dr roy mackle who was a leading cryptozoologist who worked at loch ness uh starting in the late 1960s and then later went on to search for things like the mokele and Bembe in africa so on and so forth but uh dr mackle was a pretty smart guy and uh, you know kind of along his same line of thinking, not that I'm as smart as he is, but I kind of <laughs> followed his lead, if you will. Um, if you look at the most of the anecdotal evidence of the Loch Ness monster and similar lake monsters around the world, you know, most of that is comprised of eyewitness descriptions, right? Sightings mm -hmm. and accounts. Uh, but we have a, quite a few. In fact, in, in terms of the Loch Ness monster, I think there are at least 3,000 well-documented accounts going back decades and they're fairly consistent which is compelling um, now most people have this mistaken picture of the you know the small head and the long neck kind of coming out of the water like that like a periscope with a little head mm -hmm. and um, that, a lot of that's based on the, the the famous surgeon's photo which we can also talk about which is, is not the best thing to draw one's opinion on but uh, actually Head and neck sightings of Nessie only comprise about 15% of the sightings. About 85% of people that see something in Loch Ness describe either one very large hump, you know, at least 10 feet long and sticking several feet out of the water, or sometimes multiple humps in a row that seem to be connected to one animal and that move up and down or undulate vertically when, they, when the thing is breaking the surface of the water. And people describe the skin as very smooth uh, they don't see a dorsal fin. Uh, sometimes a tail is reported and it's kind of a, a flat tail uh, or a horizontal tail, not a vertical tail. So something like a cetacean. And the head is often described as either being horse-like or sheep-like, uh, but mainly horse-like. So combining all of those physical descriptions, which again are very consistent, the animal, in my opinion, that, that would close, most closely resemble that description is something that's extinct, but it's called a basilosaur or an arche archaeocete, which is basically a very ancient type of whale that was around during the Eocene epoch about 43 million years ago. And uh, they were an, an, an ancient branch in whale evolution that allegedly died out um, millions of years ago. But, you know, they had... Uh, like whales, they had uh, presumably smooth skin. Uh, they didn't have a pronounced dorsal fin. They did have the classic fluke tail of a whale. And uh, they had, a, surprisingly, they had very horse-like shaped heads. 
Uh, they were carnivores, so they had lots of pointy teeth in their mouth, but the, the basic shape of the head, you can see it there in that illustration, has kind of a, a long, elongated horse-like shape to it. Mm -hmm. No ears, of course, but, um, um, and you know, there, that's another interesting is that, you know, every once in a while, you also get descriptions of these animals having hair, either like a, something like a mane on the back, which may be one of the influences on where we get this, you know, uh, water kelpie, water horse kind of imagery, or even whiskers, which is pretty weird. So, um, and of course, hair is also mammalian characteristics. And the last thing is the is the actual ecology of these lakes. So Loch Ness is very cold. It maintain it never freezes over, but it maintains a constant temperature of about forty two degrees Fahrenheit. Similar lakes where lake monsters are reported, again, are very cold uh, glacial lakes carved out by the retreating glaciers about 10,000 years ago. They're very deep, they're very cold. And uh, that doesn't seem, that seems like a better habitat for, for something that's uh, like a mammal, that's warm blooded or endothermic, as opposed to the old theory about these aquatic reptiles like plesiosaurs. Mm. But anyways, it's all speculation long, like everything in cryptozoology. Yeah, it's well. Just, <laughs> it's just, a, it's a best guess. And it's just, you know, in my opinion, it best fits the, the legends and, and the, the modern reports in terms of the physical descriptions and also the ecology of, of the habitat itself. Now, uh, Loch Ness in particular, I mean, there are lots of uh, supposed lake creatures and such, but do you, do you think if this thing does exist, now I'm, that's the way I'm going to state it, <laughs> it does exist. That's Is fair. It, in the lake all the time or do you think it actually can migrate up through inverness back into the ocean oh that's a great that's another great segue lon you're, you're a real pro because one of the things that i left out at the end of my last explanation you know i'm talking about ancient snake-like whales mm -hmm. living in a lake and people think a whales in a lake lakes are fresh water right well guess what um there have been examples of cetaceans or whales and and porpoises that live in fresh water in amazon you know in amazonia south america you have river dolphins that are adapted exclusively to fresh water in the yangtze river of china there are freshwater dolphins and you do have examples where whales smaller whales will come into freshwater environments like the saint lawrence river or the thames river so what i'm getting at here is that the descriptions of the Loch Ness Monster very much match the traditional sea serpents, as we call them, of the old lore. Um, you know, there were many accounts of these in the 19th century, of these giant snake-like animals in the ocean. And uh, I'm not suggesting they, they were snakes. I think the name sea serpent is just a misnomer. But yes, I think it's a fair presumption that we're talking about the same species, that the distribution is worldwide um, in the oceans, and that these animals swim occasionally into fresh water. Loch Ness is connected to the North Atlantic by a series of rivers and canals and locks, shallow rivers and canals and locks. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, um, <clears throat> similar to most of the lakes that we talk about with, with regard to lake monsters, they're almost all connected to the ocean. So yeah, I think that's, and that, that could potentially explain why people don't see these animals all the time if they're migrating. Uh, but that type of migration, again, is not that strange for, for cetaceans, but also there are a number of species like salmon, eels, sturgeon, even some types of sharks like bull sharks that will occasionally transition back and forth between saltwater and freshwater environments. Yeah, you're right, because I know of bull sharks that have come up the Mississippi River. Yep. Uh, you know, the osmosis, uh, you know, they're they're able to – you know, live in fresh and salt water. And there are a lot of species like that. Um, mm -hmm. I, and in fact, I believe belugas may be able to do the same yep. thing. Yep, belugas uh, will be seen in fresh water, rivers yeah. and things connected to the ocean. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I've talked to other researchers about the Loch Ness for years now. It's, it's kind of a, I don't know, kind of a misnomer or enigma to me. But you know, I don't discount what people say they're seeing. It's just that I, I wish people could, I wish it could be more consistent. You know, uh, if we really knew that there is enough 
to feed on there in, in, in Loch Ness? Is there enough? And I know it, it's a very deep lake. I mean, mm -hmm. it can't hide. But do you think some of the research that has gone on over the years, especially since I guess maybe the 30s up uh, to this time, do you think has 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 explained or proven that there is something there? Well, you know, Lon, you made a great argument there. And, uh, you know, I, I encourage that because I think that it's important in this field to challenge ideas and claims and particularly extraordinary claims. And I encourage, I always encourage my readers and anyone interested in the subject matter to think critically and try to stay objective and to challenge the, the alleged evidence. And in terms of the lock, you know, there are problems with, for example, Loch Ness is an oligotrophic lake. Mm -hmm. So it's very nutrient poor. There, are, there isn't a lot of algae or plankton. Subsequently, the fish population is fairly small, even for the, the amount of water we're talking about. I mean, it is deep. It's like it's 754 feet deep in spots to maybe 800 some feet. And um, so that's like 263 billion cubic feet of water. So it's a lot of water, but and mm -hmm. it's very deep and dark, but there's not a lot to eat and there's not a lot of sunlight doesn't penetrate it very well. So yeah, so you can make arguments like that, that, you know, wh why would, how would you have a population or, you know, even a few very large animals able to survive there? And I, you know, I, I always like to kind of step back and look at those skeptical arguments because a lot of them are very powerful. So, um, um, yeah. So, I mean, the only way to, if, if we assume that the Loch Ness monster does exist mm -hmm. and I'd say I'm probably 90%, you know, convinced at most because, mm. you know, same with Bigfoot. I tell people I'm 90% convinced I haven't <laughs> seen one, haven't seen one, but I've spent my life researching and interviewing witnesses. So yeah. that's as close as I can get. And that's the scientific way to look at this stuff is there's always a small margin of error. There's no, there's no certainty, you know, in our universe, other than mathematics, everything is basically a, there's always a margin of error. So, um, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I, everybody wants the Loch Ness monster to exist, obviously. I mean, the whole notion is so romantic. This, you know, ancient dragon like creatures dwells in this Highland lock with mist shrouded, castle ruins and things around. Um, I guess I, I think I look at it in terms of the bulk of evidence, which again, you have the eyewitness sightings, which are very consistent. There's a lot of sonar evidence. And that's one of the things I write about in the book that people don't talk about. People focus on the alleged photographs, which many are, ho many are hoaxes. Many hoaxes have been uh, associated with the Loch Ness Monster. Some photographic evidence is more controversial, but there's a lot of sonar evidence. But also it's the global view, you know, not just Loch Ness, but again, the Lake Champlain monster or champ, Ogopogo, uh, Lake, the Lake monsters in Russia, Ireland, Scandinavia, uh, Iceland, you know, so, and there's just the physical descriptions are always very consistent. The humps, the up and down undulations, the smooth skin, the horse like head, where do people get these, you know, and, and why are all the lakes, and you had that graphic before of all the lakes where the monsters are, and they're all yeah. kind of concentrated in the same lines of latitude, too. They're in that 40 Yeah, most are in uh, the northern hemisphere North, and northern the same latitude, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, that's intriguing. Yeah, you know, I've, I've always thought that if this thing is real, it's got to be migrating or coming in from the ocean somehow and if that's the case because i know i know the river going in through inverness and going out to the ocean is not really that deep this this thing is probably if it does do that it has to have some way of of moving on land now of course there have been witnesses who have stated that they have seen something described as nessie actually walking on land so, uh, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, the, those accounts do exist, although they're actually pretty rare um, in the big scheme of things. So they're yeah. like, like I said earlier, there are about 3,000 
well-documented Nessie sightings and only about 35 reports on land. Mm -hmm. um, and most of those are older. One, one has been fairly recent. Uh, Roland Watson is a, is a Nessie, excellent Nessie investigator who I interviewed for the book, and he's written a book about the land sightings only, if people are interested in that aspect mm. of the phenomenon. It's possible. I mean, yeah, maybe they do come on. Now, you hear the stories more in Ireland. We were talking earlier about the pasties or the um, uh, horse eels, and there, there are many accounts of them crawling from lake to lake. Uh, over short distances and kind of slithering along and even getting stuck sometimes under bridges or in cul culverts and things. So, um, but you don't hear that. And, you know, there are, I guess there are some accounts, you know, Lake Champlain, um, not so much in Okanagan or other lakes. I mean, right. like, again, the land sightings are rare, but it's possible, but you're right. Again, we have another strong challenge here to the evidence or the theory, I should say, which is, you know, the river Ness is very shallow and yeah. it's, um, it's also under constant observation. There's a lot of people that live along there and, you know, uh, I think there's only one or two very old stories of, of people seeing things swimming back and forth that could be Nessie. So, um, I don't know. It's, it's a, there are mysteries within mysteries, my friend. We don't, well, know. We don't know. You know, and the reason I'm, I'm saying that is at, um, Take uh, Lake Champlain, for instance. Now, I believe there's a strong possibility that there, there are underground aquifers and such that move out from the lake into St. Lawrence Seaway. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, then maybe what's coming in there are some type of cetacean. Who knows? Uh, and I'm wondering if that could be the possibility at, at Loch Ness. I mean, is, is there a possibility that there are underground caves that connect the ocean and the um in the lake um that's actually been a uh a lot of people have talked about that for years but that that actually is impossible on because loch ness lies 52 feet above sea level mm -hmm. and if it were connected to the ocean by underground caverns it would be sea level Gotcha. And also, and also, the water would be somewhat brackish or salty, and there have been a lot of right. water samples taken. And there's no, the salinity is very low in Loch Ness. So, but you know, you can't maybe rule that out with other lakes. Um, some of the Russian lake monsters, which I write about in my book, uh, the Lake Labinkir monster, and some of those others in Siberia, uh, it's said that a lot of those lakes are connected together by kind of volcanic vents or underwater uh caverns so that you know again you hear those stories um but yeah that that would be the the million dollar question is how these things are moving up and down now there have been uh nessie like creatures have been reported sometimes in rivers um probably the most famous is they're kind of near where you are sort of on the east coast uh the Ch chesapeake bay chesapeake yeah chesapeake Jesse's been been sighted not only in Chesapeake Bay, but you know, up river a little bit. Uh, there's also in Georgia, there's something called the Altamaha. Altamaha. Yeah. Ha. Ha, 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 yeah. Get that last ha. Um, and that's uh, the Savannah yeah. River, right? Yeah. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, think Alt the, I think Jesse. Or, yeah. But I think Jesse has been seen in. Uh, was supposedly seen in the Patapsco River. Yeah. It goes up into uh, Baltimore and Posse Patuxent River uh, that comes into Fredericksburg. Now, I'm not really sure, uh, but I have heard a lot of different things over the years. You know, I fish, I used to fish the Chesapeake Bay a lot right. when I lived down there. And uh, I've seen a lot of strange things. I mean, I've seen things moving underwater that I didn't, I knew they weren't a big rockfish. I mean, they were something, they were something. And now we have had sharks there. Oh, wow. uh, there was a huge Mako caught near Bay Bridge several years ago. And uh, these sharks do actually come up into the bay. But uh, I, I did, a friend of mine did see something go underneath the boat one time. Wow. And I don't know what the hell that thing was. I mean, this was definitely not a shark. So maybe there is something in the Chesapeake Bay. Who knows? Yeah, no recent sightings on that one, really. No, 
there was a good video shot in 1982, the Fru footage. Um, but I interviewed a local historian there in the area who's actually writing a book on Chessy and from a skeptical point of view, because he thinks it's mo mostly just a folkloric thing. But, right. um, but he was telling me that there, he, he's been digging and he hasn't found any really recent sightings since the 1990s, I think, or you know, maybe the early 2000s. But um, yeah. Yeah, well, you talk to some of the old timers, especially down in the lower bay, uh, the crab fishermen and the oyster uh, fishermen, and uh, they will tell you a lot of different things. I mean, you know, there are some huge animals in there, but for the most part, I believe they're just either huge uh, striped bass or maybe a big blue bluefish or something like that that come, you know, that are very common in the bay. Also, yeah. some huge eels too, because um, uh, I know the Batapsco River actually is a spawning ground or an air, it's not a spawning ground area where the eels, American eels, come up. And of course, they all go down to Sargasso Sea and and, and mate down there, but then they yeah. make their way back up. And uh, man, I've seen some of those in the river that are just absolutely humongous. Uh, yeah, some of those eels get pretty big. You're right, and they migrate. They're andronomous, and uh, they're also, um, at least in some of those northern rivers, you get the the lake sturgeon, which uh, yeah. are like white sturgeon. Uh, uh, there's uh, the white sturgeon there on the well. You have the Atlantic sturgeon, and then you have the white sturgeon on the Pacific coast, and some of yeah. those get to be you know seven, ten, eleven feet long, and they're really prehistoric looking fish because they've got these bony plates in the back and they're kind of like elasmobranchs or sharks because they have that cartilaginous you know weird kind of prehistoric look to them so uh, yeah they can they can get absolutely humongous i mean i i was actually i had actually seen one up in near the columbia river years and years ago mm. uh some guy had taken out of there and that thing had to have been seven foot long it yeah. was huge. Yeah, they get and um, yeah. So I guess I got to ask this question. I mean, I asked it about every other cryptid. <laughs> what is the what's the possibility that uh, Nessie or even other lock uh, uh, lock creatures are are may possibly be supernatural? Yeah. Well. Um... You know, the, I think the strongest argument for the, the supernatural advocates is always, you know, why can't, why can't we find them? You know, why are the photographs right. never good enough? Why don't we have a body that washed up on the shore? Or, you know, and again, those are good challenges. Um, I'm not, you, you know me, I mean, I've obviously, I've investigated things like the Mothman and some Dogman encounters and things and s some of those kind of fringe cryptids or creatures but um you know i i tend to be a little bit more of a traditional cryptozoologist in terms of focusing right. on the zoological part so i totally understand why people think those things because you know again the lack of evidence almost seems supernatural that's the thing that's really hard to wrap our heads around is that if they are animals even if they're very rare and elusive you know they're, they're it just seems like you know at least we'd have you know, a better photo, you know, a clear photo, something. So, um, you know, my, as you know, my, my great friend and, and colleague, Nick Redfern wrote a book called Nessie a few years ago. And he, he kind of took a, uh, that was an interesting, you know, kind of look. That and that's what about. I was referring to. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there is a lot of weird stuff about Loch Ness. I mean, mm. obviously, you know, aside from Alistair Crowley, you know, living alongside the Loch and doing, <laughs> weird rituals and things for, for years. You have a lot of the old Gaelic legends. You know, we talked about the water kelpie originally being like kind of a spirit animal and a shapeshifter. Um, there's a ghost ship on Loch Ness. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but there's there are stories that have like every, something like every 10 or 20 years, there's this ghost ship, this old sailing ship that's seen fly, you know, so that's kind of a weird old story. So yeah, you get that. You know, you get a lot of that that kind of spooky, eerie, supernatural vibe, particularly with Loch Ness. Mm. I, I don't know if you could apply that per se with some of these other lake monsters. And you know, and then I always have to make like the arguments like, um, 
like people talk about Bigfoot traveling through portals and like my retort to that is always like, well, why are all the portals way out in the wilderness? Why aren't there portals in the Walmart parking lot? Why aren't there portals in Times Square? You know, and the same thing applies to Nessie. It's like if Nessie is supernatural, why is or creatures like Nessie, why are they not being seen in tiny ponds in, you know, Kentucky? Why are they always seen in these northern glacial cold connect deep connected to the ocean types of similar lakes and why are they grouped together in seemingly a biological distribution you know that that I, but i don't know i mean we you know we're, we're so fallible as humans long we just don't know that much <laughs> you know i can probably and you know i have talked about the the uh, supernatural aspect of a lot of cryptids i know you big have foot up, yep. big yep. foot up right canines i've I've been preaching that for a while now, the possibilities. But when it comes to um, late creatures, ah, that seems kind of a stretch to me. Uh, of course, I like you said, Nick wrote about, about this, and uh, he talked about it with me. And I thought, eh, well, I don't know. You know, that's, you know, Pete was talking about thought forms and things showing up here and there. And I thought, okay, well, that may very well be. But, of course, you know everybody there's conjecture on all this stuff and uh i guess it's our job to to figure it out yeah and there's also bias and you know that's yeah, something yeah. that i like to talk about in all my books and i don't mean that in it i don't ever mean that to sound negative or to be in a negative thing but it's a true fact that all human beings are very much individuals in terms of our belief systems how we were raised, what our experiences have been, you know, our cultures and all these things. And so all of us have different ways or filters of looking at things. And particularly when you're talking about the unexplained, which is, you know, these are, these are topics that touch us in a very profound way at the very root of our, you know, of our being, you know, these are the great mysteries, the enduring mysteries of, of humanity. So, um, so yeah, I understand why some people have more of a of an interest in supernatural, or at least more of an acceptance, or maybe they've experienced things in their life, you know, lived in a haunted house when they were growing up. I hear that a lot and stuff like that. Um, you know, Nick, of course, is an excellent cryptid researcher, but you know, he's also very well known in the UFO field, and he's investigated a lot of you know, and written a lot of great books about Roswell and a lot of the great UFO cases and, you know, things like that. So he's got kind of a different um, way of looking at phenomenon than I do, which is cool because that's how people come and, or you, and that's how people come up with different ideas and, and, and we, we exchange those ideas and, yeah, you know, who knows? I mean, yeah, you know, us, us guys have been uh, involved with the uh, the abduction scenarios and aliens and this and that. Yeah, we kind of get uh, touched when it comes to the cryptids because we kind of put a little bit of that together. Now, of course, here in Pennsylvania, with, we, there have been some sightings of like Bigfoot and UFOs together and other places as well. But there are there seem to be some connections. Of course, the press Isle uh incident is a perfect example so uh i don't know i mean yeah i guess i, I guess i i use a lot of that influence of stuff i've investigated and kind of tied together so uh, can, can we eliminate one aspect of of the lake monster mystery sure and i think we can all definitively agree that we can't connect it to ufos so lake no, monster, I, I believe the Loch Ness I, monster does <laughs> i've never heard anyone suggest that but at least there, I, I think we can rule that one out i mean i know people talk about bigfoot sightings with with ufo <laughs> activity in the area mothman but yeah i can't think of any anyone ever describing a a, a spaceship landing over loch ness and a, a a giant 40 foot monster coming out and going to the lake so i don't know i dig yeah well i i can i can buy that i mean uh i i have not heard of anything even <laughs> suggesting that other than maybe these uh these flying manta ray beings that yeah. i've been reporting on for years That's uh weird. there may be a connection there somewhere to do with you know something associated possibly with water and flying and such but yeah beyond that i think it's a stretch um <laughs> 
you know, I'd like, I'd like to be a little self-indulgent here for a moment and vent if I could a little bit because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I get, obviously I have a lot of people that reach out to me to share their experiences with sightings, which I'm always excited and happy to, to hear and listen to people and, and hear what they have to say. Um, I, every once in a while I run across somebody and it's often an experiencer or someone who's, who's had some kind of encounter or something that they can't explain. And they basically tell me that they alone have solved the mystery of all of these things, you know, and it's always related. It's Bigfoot, it's UFOs, it's ghosts, it's whatever, but they are the ones who finally put the, all the pieces together. And I, I got to tell you, Lon, I take that, I, maybe I shouldn't, but I kind of take it a little personally, uh, you know, not only on my behalf, but for, for people like you and for all of the, the hundreds of excellent investigators of the unexplained that I've, I've had the honor of working with through the years, because, you know, all of us have been working hard trying to solve these mysteries and, and get to the truth. And so when someone kind of comes at me and like, Hey man, uh, you know, I figured it out. Dummy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think we all heard that though. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I agree with you. It's like, okay, well, do I want to hear what this person has to say or not? I will listen to them. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, yeah. Listen. but anyways, I, I, I bumped heads with a couple of those guys lately because I'll call them out a little bit and I'll say, look, it's kind of, it's, you're, it's disingenuous to me and other investigators out there that you are the one that figured this all out. And we're all just kind of bumping around in the dark for de decades and we don't know what we're doing. So none of us know, no. you know, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I love cryptozoology, but I'm also very interested in UFOs and the paranormal and all of these things. I have friends that do all of these different, and it's, it's to me, it's anything unexplainable is, is incredibly fascinating. And I've been, I've been loving watching these news reports lately every night with the you know the navy pilots and the finally ufos are like making it onto like the headline yeah you, you know not that i have a strong opinion on what that means but it's just fun to kind of watch that and say oh they're going to have a, a, a pilot another pilot's going to come on and talk about a ufo they saw and so i don't know so all this stuff is fascinating and fun i guess that's the only point i'm trying to make well between you and i i'm skeptical of all that but who knows you know i, I i'm of the, of the mindset that unless they've got to tell us, they're not going to say too much. Yeah. Um, I, you know, and I, I don't know. I mean, they, they, there's obvious, there's, there are obvious considerations there. I mean, people could obviously panic mm -hmm. consider, especially after everything we went through with this horrible pandemic, it was like we were living uh. in a science fiction movie. And now if they, they were to come down and say, Oh yeah, then the aliens really are here. <laughs> you know, that might, that might tip us over the edge, but I will say this, one of the theories that they were talking about, this is just my, you know, little wheels turning here, but you know, they're talking about that. This is technology that maybe if not our military has that maybe God forbid, Russia or China has developed some incredible hypersonic technology for these UFOs. Well, if yeah. that's the case, why have people been describing these things since the 1940s? Exactly. You know, they didn't come up with that technology back then. So it's the same thing. People are still seeing these UFOs and they act the same, right? I mean, they're, they move at impossible speeds and they can jump around and vanish. And I don't know. So I don't, I'm not saying they're aliens, but <laughs> I'm skeptical that these, some of them may be military, but I'm skeptical that the, the phenomenon as a whole is just a misunderstanding based on some kind of recent technology. That doesn't make sense to me. So let's talk about other sea cryptids now. You know, starting with those leviathans that supposedly destroyed sailing ships in the open ocean. Yeah. Is there any real tangible evidence that any of this occurred at any point? Um, well, you know, most of the old sea serpent, well, you know, you get to the real old stories, like guys like Olus Magnus back in the, in the 16th century was writing about, um, you know, these sailing ships being torn apart by these great sea serpents. And then later on, you had stories from, you know, Eric Pontopadon, the Bishop of Bergen and different people. But most of the sea serpent <coughs> accounts, the famous ones from the 19th century, did not really involve any hostility. You had the most famous was in 1848 when you had the uh, the HSS, HMS Daedalus. Mm -hmm. uh, which was a British frigate that was sailing off the coast of, of Southwest Africa there. And they 
you know, like 11 crew members watched this thing swim by and it didn't attack them. They were just like watching it <coughs> through their glasses and things and saying, that's a sea serpent. Um, and there have been similar observations through the years. So I don't know if these things are, are potentially aggressive. Now, that said, there are a lot of, I found researching the for the, the book, I found actually a lot of accounts of boat, modern boats either being directly lifted out of the water, presumably by one of these lake monsters, and then dropped back down, or a couple of times kind of being rammed or, or whatever. Yeah. So that, that's, that seems to be a recurring thing. It happened in, uh, there are stories in Loch Ness, but also in uh, Scandinavia, uh, uh, a lake monster named Selma, um, in Lake Memphremagog up there. Um, uh, I think one in Okanagan, one in Australia. So the, this is a recurring story where some guys are out in a, usually a small boat and it just literally like rises up out of the water like they're on the back of some animal that's lifting them out of the water and then it eventually it drops them back down. So that seems to happen quite a bit, which would be pretty scary. I think pretty terrifying if you were out, you know, bass fishing or whatever, and suddenly you realize that something <laughs> just yeah. out of the water and lifted you up. Um, so I don't know if the, the, the traditional Loch Ness monster or sea serpent or lake monster, I would consider to be particularly aggressive. I think, you know, you always get those old stories. Um, and again, a lot of those, like, you know, again, like with Bigfoot, you know, I mean, I'm not an advocate of the Bigfoot being the Sasquatch being dangerous or aggressive towards humans, as you know, but if you go farther back, then you get the old stories like, um, you know, Teddy Roosevelt's story about the trappers, Bauman and the guy getting killed by a Bigfoot and the, uh, the eight Canyon story from 1924, where the, the miners are being attacked. So, I mean, that's the parallel there is usually those stories of the attacks and aggression are usually like older stories. And uh, you don't hear a lot of modern accounts that, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, yes, these, these cryptids are monsters in terms of their appearance and they're big and they're frightening looking and we don't know what they are, but I don't view them personally as monsters in terms of, you know, they're not out to get us. They're just animals that are probably trying to avoid us, if anything. Now, there is one uh, one of these sea creatures that kind of fascinates me. And I, I know you did the show up in Alaska and up in that area, um, the uh, Cadborosaurus. And I'm mm -hmm. quite sure you've heard of that. Well, you had it in the book. Can yeah. you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, Cadborosaurus, uh, or you know, shorter nickname is Caddy, is a sea serpent animal that's been reported um, off the coast of British Columbia, uh, specifically in a place called Cadboro Bay, which it's named after, and the Straits of uh, Juan de Fuca and um, the Georgia Straits and some of those little, you know, kind of in between Vancouver Island and, and the mainland there in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe the sightings go up all the way to Alaska. Um, but uh, the, the really the best photographic evidence for any lake monster or sea serpent is actually related to the Cadborosaurus. Yeah. And it's not even of a live animal, but uh, interestingly enough, it's of a cadaver, <clears throat> a carcass that was pulled out of a whale's stomach back in 1937. Uh, on a place called Queen Charlotte Island in uh, in a, at a place called Naden Harbor. And these whale flensers, who are the guys that clean the whales when they the, the whalers used to drag in these sperm whales and things, and they would clean them out <clears throat> and kind of get the blubber and all that stuff. They found this like snake-like animal plopped out of the stomach, and it was about 12 or 14 feet long. It had kind of a weird camel or horse-like head it had a kind of a fluke tail and two flippers on the front end. And it didn't seem to be rotting and decomposing. It seemed to be fairly well intact, like it had just been eaten by this whale. And no one had ever seen anything like it before. So, uh, none of the people there. So the guy in charge, whose name was Hubbard, he, uh, he had them lay this animal out on a, some boxes. You just showed a photo and they mm -hmm. put a white, white sheets behind it for contrast. And he took some photographs. And um, the photographs were later published in some newspapers and things. 
Um, sadly, uh, tragically, no one knows what happened to the actual carcass itself. It seemed to have disappeared. There was a rumor that some of the remains may have been sent to a museum in British Columbia. Uh, but, you know, it may have just been unceremoniously dumped back into the ocean. Who knows? Yeah. But anyways, this particular photo, as weird as it looks, it fits the classic archetypical sea serpent in terms of the horse-like head, the long snake-like body, the two flippers and the, the skin or, you know, it's got, a, it seems to have maybe even like a mane or something going down the back. So it kind of fits the description. Now it would be a smaller sea serpent since mm -hmm. the, the people have described them being like 40 to 60 feet long, maybe a hundred feet long in extreme cases. So it would be a juvenile perhaps, but even skeptics, have, uh, of cryptozoology uh, have looked at this photograph and said, you know, this, I mean, it's not impossible that this was a real animal that's just unknown, you know, and there's nothing we've ever seen before. So I don't know. I, I again, it, it looks to me, it, it, it doesn't look like a plesiosaur, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. clearly whatever that thing is, it's a mammal. And um, the thing that it most resembles would again be one of these ancient snake-like whales that, that I was talking about, bacillosaurs or archaeocetes. It's, it's not exactly like, but closest to that, you know, like almost like it would have evolved from something like that. So I don't know. I think that, that to yeah. me is pretty compelling evidence. And and that, that photo itself kind of reminds me of some of the depictions of uh, champ that people have made over the years yeah. yep. uh, with that horse-like head and... Uh, well, of course, he had the Manzi photograph, but, yep. you know, some people have seen, or supposedly have seen something and described it with that horse-like head. So uh, that's kind of what I related to. And I, I think there have been some expeditions up in the region. Uh, to in, There's a particular lake, and I forget the lake offhand, where there had not, and it hasn't been too long ago, where they had actually gone in there looking for something similar to this yeah and um so presumably the cadborosaurus and again there are many sightings there off the the coast of bc that predate the loch ness monster even mm -hmm. um and, and the lake champlain monster pretty predates both of those there were there was a big champs flat back in 1873 sure. so pt barnum actually put out a reward so i mean it was a so yeah, these things have been around for a long time, uh, whatever they are, if they exist. And um, so again, I think the uh, the Naden Harbor carcass is, is a compelling. Now I talk about, there's a chapter in my book that's dedicated to uh, some, some confounding carcasses is the title of the chapter. And it's true, there have been many cases of animal carcasses that have washed up shore on shore around the world that have been ultimately identified were originally called monsters or sea serpents. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the most famous of, of is, is like the Stronce beast, which was, you know, up in, uh, you know, the Orkney islands off the coast of Scotland back in, uh, right. uh, early 1800s. And then you had, um, you know, many other examples, but all of those have been subsequently identified as being either rotting, decomposing, basking sharks, or whale carcasses. And another famous one, of course, is the Zayomaru carcass, which was pulled up out of the ocean off the coast of New Zealand by a Japanese trawler in 1977. And everyone has seen the photo of this thing like kind of hanging from ropes and it looks like a plesiosaur. Um, you know, it hasn't been definitively been identified as a basking shark, but it seems to be based on studies that have been done on its uh, physical composition and, and things. So, um, yeah, so, you know, that, that would be the hope is that if these animals actually exist, that one day one of them will actually wash up on a, on a beach somewhere. But, um, you know, the oceans are vast and deep lawn. I mean, 71% of the earth's surface is covered by deep water. That's averaging 12,000 feet deep. I mean, yeah. that's, that's way deep. And so there are definitely things down there that we haven't seen yet. Yeah, I think we'd be shocked if we actually knew what was down there. You know, uh, the possibilities are endless, I believe. Uh, you know, and if anybody has seen it, they either didn't live to tell about it or, 
or they're just keeping quiet about it. But uh, yeah, I uh, I don't know. I you know I, I you know lake creatures, ocean creatures hasn't really been my forte though. I, I would talk about it. I, I do. I am interested in it. Of course, everybody's been interested in the Loch Ness monster, but. Well, I mean, you know, after you start looking into it, and there's many lakes, especially in the United States and North America. And a lot of it comes from Indian or Native American lore and such. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, but people do, in modern times, do seem to see them. I mean, you mentioned uh, Lake Champlain, and there was a sighting uh, there back in the 1800s from a steamboat who I mean, were the People had actually seen this thing. And of course, the ABC film at Lake Champlain has always fascinated me. I don't know what the hell that thing was, but you know, it, it was pretty it was pretty convincing to me that there was something in there that really scientifically shouldn't have been there. Yeah, there there are a few compelling photos, and we didn't really get we haven't had a chance to get into it too much, but you know, there's a lot of sonar evidence for these animals. Yeah. I mean, in Loch Ness, there have been sonar contacts dating back to 1954. Quite a few, actually, by different scientific teams through the years using mm -hmm. different levels of sonar technology as it's gotten better and better. As recently as September of last year, there was a sonar contact made by a, a boat skipper there on Loch Ness who has a tour boat. And uh, I think Ronald O'Brien was his name. And this thing mm -hmm. was like 500 feet deep. And it was basically this long looked like a solid animal about 15 feet long, or I'm sorry, 20 to 30 feet long. And uh, so there's a lot of sonar contacts in Loch Ness, also in Lake Champlain. There have been, there's been sonar evidence even some recently mm -hmm. um, and some of these other lakes too. So, I mean, that's a whole nother level of evidence that, you know, and of course everyone out there, your listeners are, are very educated. So they know what sonar is. It's basically, you know, like these, fish finders they're just beaming sound waves through the water and then they bounce off of targets and echo back to a, a transponder and you basically get a contact of something sometimes it's a small fish but you know these these the ones that i'm talking about are they're not schools of fish according to people that have analyzed the contacts they're like solid objects that are animate and moving and mm -hmm. big so i mean that's that's a whole nother level of evidence so you know, maybe as the technology gets better, Lon, you know, with sonar and underwater cameras, and now you have eDNA, and uh, that's that's taken place at Loch Ness. So with all this new technology, there is a chance that maybe we'll at least get a definitive answer to the uh, the lake monster mystery. Well, we can only hope, really. Yeah. Uh, now I'm going to go completely off subject and ask you, you – uh, about a year and a half ago, you were involved with uh, the film Terror in the Skies from Small Town Monsters. And, uh, of course, you, you know about our investigations in the Chicago, Lake Michigan mm -hmm. area of these winged humanoids. I, I have never asked you, what do you think about that phenomenon? Well, um, you know, admittedly, Lon, you were gracious enough to send me a lot of those accounts early on when they first started kind of coming in. And uh, I read a lot of the eyewitness descriptions. I haven't personally interviewed any of the witnesses, but I read a lot of the, the descriptions and the, the early reports. And, um, you know, I think that it fits the traditional Mothman in terms of, you know, you have basically a lot of concentrated accounts in a, in a short period of time in a specific mm -hmm. area. That was kind of the, the pattern in, in Point Pleasant with the original Mothman, right? And I've investigated similar flying humanoid flaps in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So it oh, seems yeah. like, and I, I, there's, I know there's also been one going on in Kansas City recently as well. Yes, sir, so, yes. so you get these kind of, it's like they just, you know, nobody hears anything. For, you know, there are no reports, you know, for any given amount of time or that anyone's ever heard of. And then all of a sudden this thing appears and people, a lot of people are kind of seeing it. And, um, you know, it's uh, as far as the flying humanoids in general, I mean, I don't view that as a zoological problem because, you know, based on the descriptions of, you know, they just it's they're just too weird. I mean, when you're talking about combining like human like features with wings and, you know, and then, you know, they're often the circum the, the behavior patterns, 
you know it's like these right. these these flying humanoids are very menacing right they they chase cars and they 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 come out of the night and just terrify people and stuff and they seem to almost and i write about this in my book encounters with flying humanoids it almost seems like these flying humanoids whatever they are they kind of like feed off of the the, the emotion of fear or they're drawn to that that emotion mm. um but i don't know I, I view that as more of a metaphysical thing and so you know i, I know i know the big argument against the the you know the michigan chicago great lakes mothman flap has been well you know chicago come on man why are people seeing this weird thing in chicago well if it's not an animal and if it's more of a supernatural or a metaphysical construct then that at least makes sense that it doesn't have to follow any zoological rules it can show up wherever it manifests or appears and it's gonna you know that's its haunt or its area or whatever but um I don't know. And I, I, I don't really, you know, and I know a lot of people like to, you know, with, in terms of the Mothman, there's always, of course, the, um, the, the Silver Bridge tragedy is, is yeah. always connected. And so there's this, uh, this worldwide view that these flying humanoids like Mothman are basically harbingers or, or omen, you know, an omen of some kind of some, but you know, it, I mean, in terms of the Chicago area, you know, that would be interesting. And, you know, where these sightings occurred, to my, to my knowledge, has there, had there hasn't been any kind of, like, tragedy or anything like that in that specific area, has there? Since yeah, not that I or? know of. I mean, you know, Chicago's got a lot of issues anyway. But, yeah. you know, as far as anything that we can connect to the phenomena, no, we just haven't really had that, you know. Though I have had literally hundreds of, people living that who live in chicago i hadn't seen this thing who have called me to know ask me what the hell is going to happen in chicago of course i can't tell them that uh but you know people were people were frightened of it now of course most of the sightings in the past year and a half have been at o'hare which is yeah. crazy you know we're trying to really trying to get a get a beat on that because that you know and of course there's been some ufo and possible alien involvement as well so i don't know you know yeah so again all that fits can... that whole mothman pattern yeah. where you have all this yeah. kind of weird keelian stuff happening together oh absolutely so. yeah um yeah i don't know man it's um you know i these i've gotten a couple of <clears throat> uh mothman or flying humanoid experiencers recently that reached out to me that said that these things actually manifested in their house. Like there was one couple that claimed they were laying in their bed yep. and it was like hovering. It came in and it was hovering over them in the bedroom. And that was a pretty harrowing account. So, I mean, I can't imagine how terrifying something like that would be. So again, you know, this is not whatever this phenomenon is. And I, you know, no, people don't always connect this like I do, but I, I, I see a lot of parallels to the dog man phenomenon too, because you know, like like the flying humanoids, Dogman doesn't fit into the paradigm of the natural world. It's not a flesh and yeah, blood you, you animal. You think along the same lines as me, because and it, it appears, it behaves a lot of the same ways, and it, yeah. it vanishes, and it you know there are green mists and popping noises, and you know it's yeah. So I don't know. I'm not I'm not a paranormal researcher <laughs> per se, but that's yeah. that's how a lot of that feels is that it's it's just something you know not of this earth and i'm i'm not and i'm not too humble to say lon that that type of stuff is beyond my understanding <laughs> i don't i don't under i don't have the answers and i you know I, I think i think humans should get comfortable with that notion that there are things in our world and our universe that maybe just are not understandable that we're just not there yet in terms of being able to grasp exactly what's going on absolutely well, it's been a conundrum to us, and uh, but it's kept us busy, and when we're busy, we're happy. So, you know how well, that is. Yeah. Well, you know, you're to be commended for documenting all of those those sightings and and putting them out there, and you know, people can form their own opinions, you know, based on sure, you know, reading your books or or looking into the cases more if they like. So. So before we go, I want to ask you to tell the folks how they get contact with you and uh what projects do you have forthcoming 
Well, thanks again for having me on, Long. It's always an honor to be on your show. I've been been here many times, and I've, I've appreciated it each and every time. Um, so uh, people can contact me on my website, KenGerhard.com, but I'm also all over social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and now even the dreaded TikTok. I've, I've had to get on there. So um, <laughs> I have a YouTube channel. I've got some cool little short cryptid videos that, that I do if people want to check that out. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm contactable. Um, as far as what I have going on right now, I'm going to be doing a lot of lectures around the country at different Bigfoot conferences. And uh, hopefully some folks will come out and uh, see me. Um, but I'm getting ready in a month. Uh, I'm headed with a group from Texas and Oklahoma out to Northern California, and we're doing a, a, an eight-day expedition to search for alleged evidence of giant salamanders, which have been reported, um, that are reported in Native American lore up there, but also many sightings in the, in the 20th century. And these are like supposed to be like five foot long salamanders, um, similar in size to the Asians giant Asian species like the Chinese and Japanese giant salamanders, but mm -hmm. could be something else. Um, we don't know. We don't know if they even exist, but we're going to go out there and search for them. And then, uh, so I'm excited about that. And, uh, oh, and we do have a, uh, you know, I, I hate to be that guy, but we do have a GoFundMe because, you know, in, in cryptozoology, there aren't, there, there's, there are no grants. There's no sponsor. It's just us basically going out, you know, out of our pocket to do this. And we yeah. we'd love to do it. But uh, if anyone out there wants to to get involved, we, we could definitely use some donations to help us just kind of pay for our rental car and our gas money to drive 4,000 miles. Yeah, <laughs> so, we're all in that boat, believe me. And so anyways, I, I know you more than anybody because you're out there all the time. and uh, It's tough, but I, I love what I yeah. do and I'm passionate about it. But um, yeah. people don't understand that there's not a lot of, you know, there's not – there isn't the fame and glory and, and wealth that people often imagine with this kind of thing. We, those of us that do it, we do it because we love it and we're passionate about it. And, uh, you know, it's a living, but it is expensive to, to do a lot of this kind of research, you know, because yeah. you got to travel and buy equipment and stuff. So anyways, well, Ken, best all the power to you, man. I appreciate you coming on with me tonight and uh, it's always good to talk to you and uh, let's keep in touch. Same here, Lon, and uh, thanks to everyone that uh, in the chat room, everyone that tuned in, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll talk again real soon. Okay, well, you take care. You too, buddy. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have an unexplained encounter or sighting, feel free to contact me through the Phantoms and Monsters blog site. I want to, again, thank Ken Gerhardt for joining me this evening, and thanks to each and all of you for watching and chatting. You know, if you made a super chat donation, it's truly appreciated. Your support is what uh, makes this a possible. And uh, please like, subscribe, and share. And uh, next week, we've got a 14 Friday show, which we're going to have Manuel Navarrete and uh, Reagan Lee joining us from the Phantoms of Monsters 14 research team. So until next week, stay healthy, have a safe, enjoyable weekend. Good night.